The Culture Pop Podcast is brought to you by the law offices of Jacob and Ronnie. Accident or injury, call Jacob and Ronnie. Call Jacob. Hey, it's Mace. If you or a friend or loved one is injured in an accident, the first person you should call is my friend Jacob. When I did this, Jacob was great. He helped me by talking through the next steps, which really put my mind at ease. When you're injured in an accident, you got to have an expert. That's why you call Jacob, just like I did. Call Jacob, 844 24Jacob. That's 844 24Jacob. Or visit calljacob.com. Call Jacob. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Culture Pop Podcast. I'm Steve Mason, along with Sue Kalinsky. Sue, how you feeling? I'm feeling wonderful. I am excited because we are joined today by the pride of the Bahamas, a two-time NBA champion, and for many years, the analyst for Lakers radio broadcast. My friend Michael Thompson joins us. Michael, I see the Bahamian flag behind you. How you doing, man? Right there, every day I get up, sing the national anthem, and, and salute the flag. There you go. There you go. So, uh, Michael, I want this to be a little bit of a different conversation than we have on the radio, right? You always talk about the Bahamian grill master. That's what you would be yeah. in an interview situation. So That's I'm going right. to do a little, little bit of that uh, with you, and I want to get into your life experience and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you talked about, uh, you always talk about uh, coconuts and huts and all that kind of stuff in the Bahamas. What was your growing up actually like? Like, what was your house like? Your mom and dad, what they do for a living, all that kind of stuff. My father was a very successful businessman. He wasn't, uh, you know, uh, Steve Bomber or anything like that. He wasn't a Bahamian bomber, but uh, <laughs> he was. Uh, we, we we were upper middle class. Some people thought thought we were rich. So a lot of my friends, because we lived in a really nice neighborhood, had a nice stone house with four bedrooms. I had to share bedrooms because we had seven kids, so we had to share bedrooms. But it was very comfortable living. We never wanted for anything. Always had all the clothes we needed. Um, nothing was wasteful, of course, or wasted. But we had all the food we wanted to eat. We traveled as a family on vacation to the United States when I was uh, 10, 12, 13 years of age. So my father was a very good provider for his family. So we grew up very upper middle class, very privileged, and um, had our first TV when we uh, went in about the early 60s. How about that? We got our TV. Oh, wow. It was, yeah. It was, it, was, it was black and white at first, and you had to get up to change the channels, but we were so excited to have a TV in, in our house. We couldn't believe it. Were you the first uh, house on the block to get a TV? We were one of them, yeah. yeah. We really were. And uh, the thing is, you had to have an antenna on the roof, the old-fashioned antenna on the roof, and if the weather was bad, reception wouldn't come in. It would be yeah. a real snowy picture. So we, the weather had to be good to be able to see a clear picture of the TV. If the weather was bad, you couldn't watch TV. Do you remember, I? because when I was growing up, I'm, I'm a couple of years younger than you. There were, there, before we got a color TV, there was this thing that my father bought. It was like some weird screen. Oh that my you God, put, I have this too. My that grandfather had this. you would put over this. the screen to make it color, but it like, it was like lines and stuff. I mean, it really didn't blend, right. but it made it color. Yeah, I remember that. We didn't have one of those, but I remember those being on the market. Some of my friends did have that. And boy, I tell you, it, we have, it was like living in with the Fred, Fred Finstone days back in the Stone Age. When you think <laughs> about the, how far technology's come in the last 50 years. That's for sure. So is basketball big in the, in the uh, Bahamas? Were you playing against smaller guys? totally dominating in pickup games. What was it like down there uh, when you were when you were playing ball? Well, when I was a boy, uh, when I was 10, 8, 10, 12 years of age, baseball was the number one sport in the Bahamas. And the Dodgers were the team. Mm. Billy Davis, Maury Wills, uh, Jim Gilliam, Sandy Koufax, Don Drysdale. That was a team for the Bahamas. That was a team of the Bahamas. Even though we were close to the East, East, East Coast, to New York, to the Yankees, and to the Orioles and, and Chicago White Sox, people like that, Chicago Cubs, the Dodgers, even though it was the farthest away team from the Bahamas, everybody in the, in the Bahamas loved the Dodgers because they used to train in Vero Beach, Florida. And sometimes they would come over to Nassau and play a preseason game, an exhibition game. Hmm. And I think that's why we fell in love with the Dodgers back in the 50s and 60s. And they've been, been the Bahamas' team ever since. But when I was growing up, I didn't play basketball until I was really 15. I was into baseball and I was into American football watching Joe Namath and Len Lenny Dawson and the Kansas City Chiefs. That was my sports growing up. I like basketball, but that was like my third favorite sport behind football and, uh, and baseball. Hmm. So how did you get involved with uh, basketball? Were you, were you always tall? Were you a tall little kid? Yeah, I was always tall, always the middle kid in the school pictures. 
or I should say the school carvings back right. those days. You know, <laughs> carvings, have, the etchings, yeah, yes. Right, the etchings, right. We didn't have uh, cameras in the Bahamas. We were uh, carved on coconut trees. But I was always a kid in the middle and because I was always tall. And then by the time I got to be 15, we, play, we had a uh, church league, about eight churches, and we played against each other. And I was about six foot five at 15 years of age. Wow. I was so tall. My, my oldest brother said, well, you're going to play basketball. Even though I didn't really didn't want to, had no intention to. But he made me play on the church team. And I was a fortunate kid because I was I was I could play any sport that I, I went to. I was the anti mace. Anything I wanted to do, I could do <laughs> athletically and I could play, I could pick it up just like that. So yeah. basketball came naturally to me, even though I had no formal training or coaching. I just could play right away as a 15, 16 year old. And I kept growing. And by the time I was 17, I was six foot eight, six foot nine. So they say, you know what, you're 16, 17 years of age. You should try to go to Miami, Florida to see if this basketball thing could take you anywhere because I had a lot of talent, but I really wasn't thinking about playing high school or college basketball at the time. I was just thinking about becoming a pilot. That's what I wanted to do. Right, right. So how did it happen that you wound up going, coming to Miami? We always say, I don't know, a raft or we saw a documentary and Huggy Bear, Brian. I mean, what was the true story of how you wound up becoming part of the Jackson 5? I was uh, discovered by accident, like that uh, actress sitting in the milk count- the counter. So oh, counter. L- Lana, it was a Lana Turner. Yeah, Lana Turner. I'm the basketball version of Lana Turner, where a basketball coach just saw me by accident and asked and was impressed by my height, my size, came to my house because he was looking for another Thompson kid, but he came to my house by mistake, saw how tall I was and said, well, M- Mr. Thompson, would you let your son come over to Miami, Florida? to Miami Jackson High School and play basketball. I was 17 at the time. And my father said, no way, he's not leaving home. He's going to stay here and go to work for me. So my father said. And uh, so I really didn't, I was hoping I would go to uh, aviation school and learn how to fly. So I wasn't even thinking about basketball. But since I was six foot eight at the time, his coach discovered me by accident, looks at my size and invites me to come over to enroll in Miami Jackson High School because he came to my house by mistake while go, go, going to the wrong Thompson house. And the other Thompson kid ended up going to Jackson too. So we ended up playing together. Oh, wow. And where did you live when you were there? The coach found a, a school, a house in the district, the school district. He had a player that played for him. Now, his, that player had gone off to college. So he arranged for me to move into that player's house, to, uh, pl- deliver that player's mother for the two years that I was in high school. So he found a house for me to live there. And I had about, 10 roommates and, and that bedroom with me because they're all cockroaches. <laughs> oh, well, palmetto, what are they? Palmetto bugs, the ones that fly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, that's right. Oh, there's some big old roaches, boys. Uh, I had uh, some good roommates there with me. So <laughs> well, I just, I just, just want to tell you something very funny. Years ago, I was doing, I used to do stand up and I was staying in the condo, the comedy house that they put you up in. And it was in Fort Lauderdale. And I was with my boyfriend, who was also a comic, and we're lying in bed together one night. And he said to me, is that your foot? And I said, no. And, I, and we jumped out of the bed. It was a palm. It was a palmetto bug. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Those, yeah, those things, things are like are big. big, too. Yes, they are. They're big. And they got some they're crusty, big old shells. Man, they are some big boy. They, they can pick you up and fly, fly away with you if you're not careful. <laughs> So you guys at uh, the Jackson Five won the Florida State Championship. You went thirty-three and zero. That's right. But you guys wound up getting stripped of that title because there was uh, reports of some falsification of birth certificates or something like that. Uh, here you played this undefeated season. How how old were you when you were playing? I was. Uh, I just turned nineteen, so I was of age. I was legal of, of legal age, and so was everybody else. To tell you the truth, what happened was. They said one of our players was overage. Now, here's the story behind that. The player, Cecil Rose, who they said was overage, what he did, he was the same age as us. So he was of of legal age. But what he did, he put his age up in the Bahamas so he can join the police force. Mm. So he put his age up two years older than he really was. And he put that on um, a, a government document. And they found that. And they thought that that was his actual age. When he falsified his age to try to join the police force. Oh, that's that's interesting. So yeah. everybody was of the right age when you got. So how do you feel about being stripped of the title now? Yeah, hey, all I know is we played the games and we won them. So yeah. I, I still got the championship ring from high school about the Miami Jackson General. So, yeah, they can strip the records, but everybody knows how good we were. We weren't illegal aliens or illegally uh, over age. We were all of the of age, legal age. To play to qualify to play high school basketball, so they could try to strip us, but we know we won. So when did um, 
college uh, re- recruits come to uh, sniff around and find you? Yeah, my you, probably my senior year. My junior year, I had a kind of uh, ordinary junior year. I, I was a pretty good player, but my senior year is really, really, I really emerged as a player and became all American, all state, all American and stuff. And that's when Florida, Florida State, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, University of Houston, they all started sniffing around. And there's a lot, you're talking about, I don't know, 68. So we're talking 50 years ago. It is way different now and recruiting how it was back then because now you have all these websites that, that follow kids now from sixth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, all the way through high school. Back then, we had not, didn't have that kind of coverage or scouting. We Nobody knew about you unless they came to see you. We didn't have, obviously, social media to, to promote you and put you out there for everybody to see. So it was kind of like very slow and tedious, tedious recruiting. And they would have to actually get on a plane to come visit you, to come watch you play in high school. Because we didn't have AAU basketball where you played all season, all year round in the summer where all the scouts, college scouts can come and watch you and recruit you from there. So they would just come to our games, uh, all these schools, and uh, watch us play there and and, and uh, decide to recruit us or not. So it was, it was very slow, methodical compared to how it is now. So you went to the University of Minnesota. I always joke that you got a big bag of money, but uh, what? how much did you actually get? Nothing. I actually got nothing with the, I went to Minnesota. Everybody said, thought I did, but I didn't even think about that, Mace, because, I mean, I was just a naive, uh, ignorant uh, bo- boy off the boat from the Bahamas. I didn't know you could be bought to go to college. I mean, I didn't know anything about that. Nobody ever offered me anything. So I just Why Minnesota, Minnesota then? Of all the places, why Minnesota if you weren't getting paid? The Big Ten was a big time uh, conference. Minnesota was a big time school in the Big Ten conference, has some good basketball history. Hadn't won a championship like Indiana or anything like that with Bobby Knight, but Minnesota was uh, considered a big time program in a good city. Yeah, it was cold. I didn't like the cold, but I, I really enjoyed Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, and I enjoyed living on campus, even though the cold obviously was negative. But other than that, I had a great time in Minnesota and it was a big time program with a big time coach. One more time. The amount of money you got was. Zero. I got okay. nothing. All right. All right. I wish I did. I wish I did. I, I mean, uh, now with all this NIL stuff going on, we were 50 years behind back in those days. But yep. uh, yeah, I, I know some guys used to get paid off under the table to go to different colleges, but I got nothing. I, I had no money going up to Minnesota. My lights got turned off, Mason. When I was at the University of Minnesota. I had no money to pay the utilities. Wow. That's right. Wow. So as your college career was taken off and you, you know, you were playing great, what at what point did your parents jump on board and say, "Hmm, you know, you maybe have a chance to be a professional basketball player"? Never. You kid. My parents were in the Bahamas. They didn't even know where I was half the time. They couldn't even find Minnesota on a map. Must have <laughs> thinking about the NBA. <laughs> but of course they, because back then too, even though I wasn't playing big time college basketball, and I knew about the NBA, but as a freshman, as a sophomore, even as a junior. I wasn't really thinking I'm going to be an NBA basketball player. I wasn't thinking about going pro like how it is today. Kids are thinking about going pro when they're 10 years of age. Back then, I was just trying to stay eligible, just trying to enjoy my my time as a, as a college student and taking things day by day. And uh, even I went into my senior year, like if I was playing today, I probably would leave after my freshman year. That's a different mentality that kids have today. And kids were going, young men were going to college or to the pros from college after their freshman year. But it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. Now it's go to school for one year and you definitely are going to go pro if you're good. But back then, it was kind of rare for guys to do that. Even though they did it, it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. But I went to college and I wasn't even thinking about the MBA or professional career until about my senior year. Neither were my parents. What was your major? Trying to stay eligible. Huh. Oh, you didn't have a declared major? Yeah, I took business classes, business courses, and they were boring. You majored in trying to stay eligible. <laughs> exactly. Keeping my I, grades I didn't, up. I didn't know that that was actually offered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I took business courses. And by the way, it's course. offered at every school to athletes. <laughs> yeah, That's right. True. Exactly. Just trying right. to keep your grades up. You want to stay eligible. But I, um, I, I, if I could do it again, I probably, what would I major in? Because business courses are important. It's important to know how to handle your money and start a business and stuff like that. But it was always boring to me. I would want to do something more, more interesting. I'd probably go into, I, I would like to do astronomy, but then again, I'm not good at physics and math, but I, but I love astronomy. Yeah, Maybe I'd major in that. Maybe I'd major in that just so I could look at the planets. Yeah. 
So uh, you became the number one pick in the 1978 NBA draft. Um, and that comes with its own set of expectations. Did you ever feel pressure? Like I- I'm the number one pick. I got to fulfill my promise for my organization. Pressure came from within. I wanted to play well. I wanted to uh, be a good player, be an all-star, be a Hall of Famer. Of course, I didn't, I didn't accomplish that, but I was a good player. And when I went, when I got drafted, yeah, there is some pressure that comes along with it, but not like how it is now where everybody's critiquing you. You have the Mason Ireland show critiquing everything you do. If you're a number <laughs> one pick, poor, poor Victor Wembanyama, as soon as he has a bad week, you're going to be killing him, Mace. Talk, this calling is my him job. a bust. That's right. <laughs> calling him a bust. But see, we didn't have talk radio back there in 1978. We just had the morning paper or, or beat writers to talk about us or to criticize us. Not like how it is today, but pressure as far as having the performance of number one pick. Yeah, I knew I had to play well, but I went to a team where I didn't have to carry a team because I went to the Portland Trailblazers and they were just a year removed from winning a title and they had a bunch of good veterans on the team. And I just was uh, bought there to fit in and not carry the team. So that took a lot of pressure away from me. So, with this, so, so then you get traded. Well, you went to San Antonio. You didn't stay there very long. And then you get traded to the Lakers. What was the fan vibe when you came on this team? Because you were pretty much somewhat of a replacement, I guess, for Jabbar, right? Yeah, I, I backed him up mostly. But it was a whole different world coming to join the Lakers back in the Showtime era. Because, yeah, I was in the NBA for eight years. I played in Portland, which is basketball crazy town. They love their Blazers up there. There's no question about it. But when you join the... Uh, the Lakers, it would be like, it was like going from a garage band to the Rolling Stones <laughs> or going from, say, Nirvana to the Rolling Stones. And Nirvana is a good band. Don't get me wrong. Or going from, let's put it this way, as good as they are, let's say the Portland Trail Blazers were the Red Hot Chili Peppers okay. and, the Lake, and the Lakers were the Stones. Okay. You know, that, and mm-hmm. we all know how good the Chili Peppers are. I'm not trying yes. to put them down, but that's a level. When you play for the Lakers and the Celtics back in those days, it was a whole, that's like playing for the Lake, for, if you're a band member playing for the Beatles or the, the Rolling Stones. So even though I was in the league for eight years, when I got to the Lakers and saw the expectations and the attention that was put on that team, even this, this was before social media and everything, it took, the, it took pressure and performances and expectations to a level that was sky high. You don't play basketball in LA with the Lakers. And just expect to make w- make the playoffs. You expect to win championships, and that makes it a whole different whole different atmosphere. Was it a blow to your ego to go from star player starter playing you know thirty five minutes a game to being more of a role player and playing more like twenty five minutes a game? Oh no, man! Are you kidding me? Ask Ronnie Wood. He went from faces to playing uh, co co lead guitar in the Stones. <laughs> Ask him which one he'd rather have. And he was a, probably the lead guitar and faces, but when he got to the Stones, he had to get, move aside for Keith Richards. So that's how it was for me. I was a, sort of a lead guy on Portland, but when I got to the, to the Lakers, man, I was happy just to play backup music or whatever with these guys because I was with the best, and I knew we were going to win championships and have the whole world watching us. So taking a more of a subordinate role with the Lakers as opposed to being a star on a on a also ran team, I'd much rather be a backup player on a great team than a starter on a mediocre team. And you were you were uh, a two two uh, style player too because you played center, you played power forward. It was, it, like would you come off the bench and 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 you know, like maybe start, you know, as as a center and then come off the bench and then be a power forward? Did they did you get switched out like that and was that kind of challenging to make those adjustments as a player? Good, good, good questions, Stu. Good observation. Yeah, I played pack of four, power forward behind AC Green and Kurt Rambis, and also, of course, back of center behind Kareem. And the, back then, the positions were very similar. Just played around the basket. It's not like how it is now, where everybody's out on the perimeter, 30 feet away from the basket. Even big guys aren't that far. We were more condensed uh, as, as, a play, as a team. So it was easy adjustment going from forward and center because they're very similar in position. But you're right. That's a, that was my job. Either back up AC or back up Kareem, whichever Pat Riley wanted to put, whichever position Pat Riley wanted to put me in, and I was ready to do both. And I was, it was an easy transition for me. I could easily do both. Shucks, I could have backed up Magic Johnson there to ask me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with <laughs> your handle. Uh, so, so your wife, Julie, was a tremendous athlete. She started in gymnastics, track and field. She competed in the long jump. Ultimately, she became a really good college volleyball player. Tell me about meeting Julie. What made her the one? And on some level, were you thinking, hey, I'm an athlete. She's an athlete. We're going to have athletic kids. 
Yeah, I met her at the University of Portland in the summertime. We were playing pickup basketball at the University of Portland's gym. Julie was going to college there as a volleyball player, and uh, she walked into the gym one day, mistakenly thinking the ball that she heard bouncing was a volleyball. So she thought it was volleyball practice going on with a volleyball team, like a pickup game. She walked in there in those tight jeans, and I forgot about <laughs> playing basketball after I saw those. I saw that. I, said, I ran after saying, whoa, who is that? And uh, she turned right around when she saw it was a bunch of us basketball players in there, Blazers and some other guys practicing and getting ready for the for training camp. She turned right around, went right back down the stairs. And I said, somebody sub in for me. I got to I got to go do something. So I chased after her and introduced myself to her and uh, started talking to her right then and there. Because, you know, once you once you see that one person just catches your eye, you just got to go. You got to be brave and go say hello. And I and and and, and, and so she is so athletic. Huh. She, she played volleyball growing up, ran track, gymnastics. I mean, a woman could do backflips and stand, walk on her hands. So when we started dating and getting to know each other, I said, man, we got to have kids. We got some athletic kids, whether they're boys or girls. <laughs> so this is a question I, I'm, I'm very curious about. Um, you know, there are a lot of fathers that, that, you know, ho- that hope that their sons become athletes and, and maybe because they just want them to become athletes or maybe because there was a dream that they had that was unfulfilled. So they kind of are kind of living their life vicariously, you know, through their children. You were an athlete when you had boys, would it have been, how would it have felt for you if they weren't athletic? I, that's a great question. I wouldn't have cared. I would, I mean, I don't see, how, I don't see how they couldn't have been athletic, but you're right. Let's say they didn't like, <laughs> They didn't like sports. Then I would tell them, you know, do whatever makes you happy as long as it's legal. And as long as you have a passion for it, you know, pursue it. And I would support, I would support them, whether it's through business or through music, whatever, acting, whatever they wanted to do, as long as they were doing it the right way and being good people. That's all I mostly cared about. And, you know, you want your kids to be healthy and happy. And that's, that's the most important thing. And of course, if they want to do something that you love and you know that they can be successful at, that's just icing on the cake. So your son, Clay, is obviously a four-time NBA champion with the Warriors. He's recovered from some really big injuries, including an Achilles. Um, what are your conversations? And by the way, and Trace just got traded to the White Sox. So what is your job as a dad? To console, uh, to pump up? Like, what? How do you react to Clay recovering from injury and Trace being traded? Just to be there for them when they need you. You know, don't be an overbearing stage father. Um, they're adults now, so they, if they don't try to put too much of your advice on them, unless they ask you for it, obviously let them come to you. You know, if you see them doing something wrong, you can, you know, sort of advise them or give them some advice or, you know, some con- constructive criticism or advice or whatever. But for the most part, they're intelligent young men and, uh, they know how to conduct their own business and they don't need a lot of input from me. Um, because uh, they've been successful, especially Clay, of course, in his career so far. So he's done a hundred times more in his career than I ever did. And he's uh, he's got good, great work ethic. He has a passion for the game. So he didn't really need uh, much instruction or 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 you know input from me unless he asked for it. Then I would give it to him. Same thing for Trace. Trace would always tell me to shut up. I'm a basketball player. I don't know baseball. <laughs> so he would tell me. I say, Are you kidding me, kid? I grew up watching baseball. I didn't play it, but I, I knew everything about it because I was such a baseball, uh, passionate baseball fan growing up in the Bahamas. But I, I tell him, I, I know the game. And, uh, but he always said, no, you play basketball. He, he, he would go to his, uh, his, his teammates, his veterans on the Dodgers or White Sox and get advice from his coaches. He wouldn't ask me too much about, ba- about baseball, but he would come to me and we'd talk basketball all the time. Clay and I would talk basketball all the time, talk about other players, talk about different eras. Which era was the best? My era or this era? Of course, I always say mine, even though and the, even though the games evolve so much. So we always tease each other about whose era is the best. So you say that you didn't really give advice. What when during your career? Um, what was the best advice you ever got from a player? Probably, you know, just always be prepared. My coaches were like that: Jack Ramsey and Pat Riley. And my father, I always saw my father work so hard. So I learned good work ethic from him just outside of basketball. And then when I got started playing basketball, I was around tough coaches. Coaches didn't care about your feelings. Obviously, they cared about you as a human, but they would tell you like it is. You know, in high school and college. 
And that makes you grow up fast when they tell you what they expect from you and what your responsibilities are and how you have to be accountable, how to be an adult, uh, even as a high schooler. So I think that's lost a lot today in, in, in sports because it seems like coaches, managers or whatever are afraid to hurt got girls or boys feelings without telling them what they really need to do to be successful. You don't like the coaching today. No, I think it's too soft. I think it's un- unimaginative. All the ba- all the games in the NBA look the same. Um, coaches today looks like they want to be players' friends and not their coach. Yeah, so it's got it's gotten way soft. I like the old Pat Riley way of of coaching, where de- like Jack Ramsey demanding. They didn't they didn't disrespect you, but they treated you like an adult, and they expected you to perform and and to be an be an adult right back. And uh, if you weren't, they were going to let you know about it. It's kind of you versus we, right? So back in the day, Pat Riley would say, you need to do this. Right. Now it's, we need to accomplish yeah. that. Yeah. That's, that's sort of the shift in coaching, right? Yeah. And that's not every player, of course. You see some players that have great work ethic, like a guy like LeBron James. You don't have to tell him what to do because you know he's going to be on top of things and he's going to do all the right things to get himself prepared to win and to play. Steph Curry is the same way. Players like that too. They know how to get themselves prepared to win and to go out and play and perform at a high level. Uh, There's a lot of guys in the NBA like that, but sometimes I see guys being coddled a little too much. What about like the whole dress code thing? You know, when I was growing up, you know, I grew up in New York, Nick fan, um, you know, players wore suits when they traveled. Uh, Then that kind of started to go away. And now you see baggy pants and crazy outfits and crazy hair and all that. I guess it's just a sign of the times. But when it started to become that, did you have any feelings towards that? No, no, I'm, I'm all for, I'm anti-dress code. I hate okay. dress codes. Okay. Now, now look, you can't look like you're, you know, just you haven't taken a shower in a week. And you got holes. But if you just dress comfortably in a nice sweatsuit or some slacks and a nice uh, casual shirt and you're traveling, because when you're on a plane, I never understand because a lot of, in the NHL, I hear a lot of hockey players have to wear a suit when they travel on the plane, which is stupid because you're traveling across country for three, four hours. You're sitting there in a suit. No, you want to yeah. be relaxed. Especially if it's now that everybody flies private, no one sees you anyway. So and what they do is a lot of guys say, yeah, we got to show up in the airport in the suit. But when they get on the plane, they take the suit off and put on a sweatsuit. And then when, <laughs> yeah. they, get, uh, and then when yeah. they get off the plane, got to put their suit back on. How stupid is that? Yeah, oh, that's, that's crazy. ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Yeah, so I always hated the dress codes. Obviously, when you're on the bench in street clothes, you want to look presentable. You don't want to look like you, you know, your pants are dropping down and stuff like that. So as long as you wear casual clothes and uh or if you want to wear team attire that's good enough i mean you don't have to be in a suit that looks like you're a maitre d at a restaurant or something like that right so what's cooler winning a championship yourself or seeing your kid win a title oh man come on nothing compares to seeing your kid be successful in anything they do uh over yourself only over your own success yeah i love my opportunity to win championships and i think about it all the time and i cherish them but when you see your kids dreams are realized nothing compares to that yeah, I just got to chill just hearing you say that. So, yeah. Yeah, MT, yeah. MT, I'm going to ask you something super philosophical. You ready? Yeah. You're a man of faith. You grew up Catholic, I think, right? No, no, non-denominational. So, I, I, don't, I don't believe in religion. I believe in worshiping Jesus Christ. Okay, so who is God to you? God is the maker of the universe. God is the, is the God of all things. He is who I believe in. And who he is, who I want to spend eternity with when I die. Huh. huh. Yeah. I, so, you, so you were raised non-denominational, huh? Right. Not an, they call it brethren, but it's not really Anglican or Protestant or Catholic or Methodist. Um, they call it the brethren, but it's, uh, it's mostly just uh, going to church and worshiping God and worshiping Jesus and believing in Jesus Christ as your personal savior. That's, I believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe in a religion. So there's no communion or confirmation, and is, or is that all part yeah, of it? Yeah, yeah, we would uh, break bread and we would, uh, you know, sip the wine, just like the Catholics do. But um, it's much more informal than it is in a Catholic church. But we had the same kind of cu- customs and traditions too. So I always say I'm never retiring. You'll have to pull the microphone from my cold dead hands. Uh, how long do you want to keep going? I I, I don't want to retire you right here, but how long do you anticipate? continuing in your role as Lakers analyst? And is there a time that you would even consider retiring? You know, that's a great question. I'm 68. God's kept me in good health. Uh, I try to take care of myself, Mace. 
and Sue and what I do. I love what I do. I, I, I would like to, if the Lakers would have me, and if my health holds up, I want to do another, at least another 10 years. Wow. I know, this, I know this is a young man's game, and we just saw Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jackson get replaced, which is, a, is puzzling to me because I thought they were the best broadcast team. With they, were great. Group they were great. They were great. But yeah, they got replaced. So hey, we're, we're all replaceable in this uh, business, it seems like, except for Stu Lance, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and, but um, yeah, so God willing, I would like to do another 10 years until I'm my late 70s and the Lakers don't think I'm too old to do it. Wow. Well, Michael, I wouldn't put it past you to be doing this at uh, 78 years old and, and beyond. Um, I appreciate you coming on and doing this, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I guess I'll actually see you on the air tomorrow. But uh, it's, it's great doing this, and I appreciate it, man. You bet. It's my pleasure. Your next pop Culture Pop podcast, Pepe Mantia. We are going to do one with Pepe. All yeah. Right. You got to hey, get I, Pepe. I want to ask you one one last question. Yeah. If I were to come visit you in the Bahamas, what would a day in the Bahamas with Michael Thompson look like? Oh, man, you'd love it because it's so relaxing. Some Do you play golf? I do. Oh, my goodness. So you're a perfect woman. Do you smoke? <laughs> well, a, thank you. Would you smoke a cigar? I have. Whoa. I, 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 are you single? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I've, I've also had a lap dance or two. So here we are. <laughs> oh, there you go. So, yeah, we, we play golf. We smoke a cigar. We go by the pool, order a mojito. Uh, you know, and then we go back and then uh, we go back to our separate rooms, take a little nap. Then I'll tell you, I'll meet you at uh, seven o'clock for dinner by my favorite restaurant by the beach. And that that's basically my day, just basically doing nothing and then uh, doing everything all in one place. That's awesome, man. Well, I like to say you be you, Michael Thompson. You are one of one, a true original. I love you, man. And thanks a lot for coming on. All right, man. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. There you have it. Michael Thompson, a legend. Um, a, and again, two-time NBA champion. His kids, obviously, unbelievably successful. His wife, Julie, threw an amazing party at their house a couple of weeks ago that we got to go to. Beautiful house. Just a, just a great, original, weird, funny guy. Yeah, he's a lot of fun. And, you know, I've seen him at events, you know, at the Mandy's. I've never seen him up in, at the studio the few times that I've been up there. I've, I don't think I've ever seen him at any of your parties. Has he ever been to uh, No, Michael. Yeah. It takes He's a not lot to get good. Michael out of yeah, the house. Right, yeah, right. I know it took a lot to even get him to the Mandy's. To the Mandy's. I mean, I think we had to right. send a car and kidnap him. Right, right. But it was really a treat to uh, to meet him and, and talk to him. He's a lot of fun. Yeah, he is. He's great. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, don't forget, if you're not watching on YouTube... You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, search Culture Pop Podcast. We will pop right up. We would appreciate if you would subscribe. And same thing with Apple and Spotify, where you get your uh, podcast. We would love you to uh, give us a five-star review. We would also love if you would make a comment about the show, either on Apple or on uh, YouTube. And if you do and send us an email afterwards, you can get one of these very cool culture pop podcast t-shirts <laughs> uh, and all you got to do after you make your comment or leave your, your review send us an email say anything you want uh, but we'll send you a t-shirt mace and sue at gmail.com sue great seeing you as always and we will see everybody next time on the culture pop podcast mm -hmm.